Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access it on demand following today's webinar. Later on today, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's event you have a question for either of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take hopefully a few minutes near the end of today's presentation and go through the audience questions. And also at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So stick around, hopefully you'll be one of our three big winners. Okay, with that, we'll kick off today's webinar, which is automating API generation and DevOps pipeline for on-prem systems. Our speakers today are Zev Avidan, who is the Chief Product Officer at Open Legacy, and Eldad Omer, who is the IT Infrastructure DevOps Manager at Ayalon. Thank you both for joining me today. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, hey everybody, um, I'm, I'm Zev Avidan, and uh, I'll talk a little bit today about um, DevOps for uh, enterprise integration as a whole, uh, in terms of what are the challenges, what are the things to notice, and then I'll, I'll move it to uh, to that to talk about a specific use case with the Allen Insurance uh, uh, Group. So, when we talk about DevOps, what are we talking about, right? So, DevOps is basically the practice of merging some of the functionalities of developers and some of the functionalities of operation people in a modern way to increase velocity. So traditionally, what we would have is you would have the development side of the house, and they will be in charge basically of everything until, I would say, testing or, or uh, the test environment or the integration test environment. They will write the code. Uh, they will do it in kind of in a waterfall, waterfall fashion. So you will have you know, requirements, and they will build the code according to those requirements. They will push the code into the testing environments, and then uh, you will have the operation side of the house basically taking over from there, promoting through the different environments all the way up to production. That's a very traditional way of doing that. And that's the, the way that has been working for, you know, decades now. Um, so why change? I mean, wh why is it important to, to, to make those changes and move to a DevOps uh, uh, kind of way? Well, that approach uh, basically leads to stability you would release to production, you know, organization used to do it a uh, couple of times a year or, or maybe once a month. Um, and that's a very stable way of going about things. And that very kind of fitting to a, a world of monolith where you need to be very careful about testing things, where you need to be very careful about deploying things, but also in a world where your customers, you know, expect uh, you to change, you know, only several times a year and they don't expect rapid changes they don't expect you to move fast and and kind of their level of expectation is is uh, um, is what we all had 20 years ago now the thing that changed is that the world of software changed and now we have you know tech companies that are pushing changes to production 10,000 times a day or so uh, customers expect everything to move fast they expect better quality of service they expect uh, their needs to be met immediately. So being able to uh, uh, move at velocity becomes that more important. So what our organization found themselves kind of having to move toward is a model where they have process that support that kind of a speed. And supporting that kind of speed basically meant two things. First of all, moving away from uh, waterfall development patterns and that separation between development and operations uh, into an agile mo mode of working and a, dev and a DevOps mo mode of working so that developers have control over the entirety of the process and also using more and more automation. And these two things really go hand in hand because automation is basically kind of one of the key concepts of, of DevOps. So in a DevOps environment versus the old environment, 
I, as a developer, I have complete control over the deployment uh, of my code, my specific piece of code into production. That means two things. First of all, my scope is limited, right? I am only responsible for a very well-defined scope in terms of the actual software project. That's my domain. I have a specific functionality or a specific uh, business process that I'm in charge of. I work on that. I, you know, create, uh, generate the code for it. I uh, do the uh, the actual um, thinking about designing that code. I implement it, and then I push it through the environment. And I have complete responsibility of that piece of functionality so that I am also in charge of getting it all the way up to production through the various testing, versioning uh, uh, processes. So I, as a developer, am basically now a DevOps, meaning I am both the developer and the operations for that specific functionality. So it's I have more control in terms of the, the, the breadth of the process, but I have only a limited scope of doing things. In order to make that successful, because every developer now becomes an operations specialist, basically, uh, you can't expect your, your developers to be expert on all the different aspects of operations. Uh, they're not necessarily experts in, in delivery. They don't necessarily know all of the, your site standards and things of that nature. So in order to make enable them and empower them, and that's really what it's all about, it's empowering the developers to take charge of their scope of, of the uh, software project, in order to do that, you need to use a lot of automation. Automation works great in two key ways. First of all, it removes uh, human errors, right? So if everything is automated, uh, then the chances for you to make a mistake, you know, either a fat finger mistake or just, you know, um, deploying to the wrong environment or using the wrong parameters, all of those types of mistakes uh, are prevented by using automation. So that's one key element of automation. The other part of automation, which I would say is sometimes even more important, is the ability to add best, best uh, practices and really kind of um, uh, productize the knowledge in your organization. Not everyone knows what's the best practice for deploying. Not everybody knows what's the best practice for uh, testing. And trying to share that knowledge just by various data of sharing tools, that might get you you know, uh, up to a point, but you know, you can't really expect everybody in the organization to be fully on board with everything that you're trying to do. And of course, if there's uh, new stuff that you're trying to push, new insights that you have in terms of how things should be done, that makes the problem even more complex because some people would just have, you know, the old processes, that's what they're used to do, uh, and that's the way that they will do it. Automation solves that part of the puzzle because basically you only need to change your scripts and, uh, and 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 once you do that, everybody's already kind of on the on the on the new page in terms of their organizational know-how and the ability to uh, uh, do things in a very consistent way. When uh, when we talk about automation, we talk about both automating the uh, uh, processes, meaning basically uh, mostly it's around scripts, right? So you will have scripts into how you promote things through the environment, how you version things, how you push and, and pull from uh, from the source control. But also it enables you to do a lot of monitoring. So you have a lot of monitoring opportunities just because all of those processes are now automated. That means that you can follow them and you can monitor them in a way that was not possible when everything was done manually. Now, that means that you can actually have dashboard, and many people do, uh, that tells you what the state of your project is. And that means that you can monitor and exactly see uh, where you are in terms of uh, where your problem areas are. Uh, you might be moving you know, not as fast as you thought you might be. Uh, you might have a problem where you're moving too fast and you, you just the quality of the code being pushed is not good enough, you will be able to know all of those things. Uh, so that, again, goes to the automation part where it enables you to have a lot of these uh, hooks into your process that will tell you exactly where you are. All of that also requires some organizational changes, right? So it's not just about technology, and it, it never is. Uh, that means that some people will have to let go of 
some of the control and some people will have to take responsibility for different areas that they were not responsible for to begin with. So it's an organizational change in terms of people thinking, but also in terms of how the uh, teams are organized. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it lends itself very well into cross-functional teams where you have teams that are basically uh, units that can do the entirety of the work from front end to back end, from development to operations, um, from databases to writing code. Uh, all the know-how will be encapsulated within that team so that uh, the team can basically work through the process from beginning to an end. As it often happens, if we move to the next slide, the structure of the team uh, basically also uh, lends itself to the structure of the code or the way that the architecture is built because cross-functional teams and encapsulated teams that have everything they need uh, inside of them, uh, that also correlates very well with you know, modern ways of architecting software, which is encapsulization and containerization. So when we talk about CI, CD, continuous integration and continuous delivery, we talk about the ability to kind of continuously build the code, test the code, deploy the code, uh, uh, and being able to do so with small units of work, as we said, small decoupled units of work, which are done by small decoupled uh, teams of, of people. But in order to be able to actually do that, you need enabling technologies, and that is really where uh, a lot of people kind of uh, uh, use it in, as, as, as if it were the same thing when they use containerization. So it's important to know that containerization is not DevOps and containerization is not microservice, but the things are, of course, very closely related. So containerization basically enables you to do all of those things because using containers, you're able to uh, create environments or micro environments that are consistent, that allows you to deploy your uh, code through uh, the different uh, environments, and they allow you to build functionalities that are very separated than everything else. So you don't have that very classic house of card effect where you make a change in one place in the, in the uh, application and all of a sudden you find something wrong in another uh, uh, side of it. So being able to containerize and encapsulate the, the actual uh, uh, code leads to your ability to have to work in small teams that can work on that specific piece of functionality and also leads to your ability to move to a CI CD kind of a pipeline where you can continuously create integrate and deliver that code uh, without kind of being afraid of changing everything else all of that of course lends itself very nicely into the microservices pattern uh, which again is not exactly the same thing as a container and uh, microservices is basically uh, that piece of functionality uh, which is encapsulated within that container. So just to make things a little bit more clear, what are the differences between the things? So containerization, you can build a container and have that container basically hold multiple API endpoints. Uh, that's technically absolutely uh, uh, possible. And a lot of people do use that pattern. It's called a mini service. So you would have a mini service that has a domain. So all of your customers' APIs will be within that container. That container will not be a microservice. So that's a completely valid pattern. You don't have to do a microservice pattern. In this case, you're using CI, CD, but the scope of the functionality is a little bit larger than what you would do in a microservice. So all of the customer functions are encapsulated within that container. This is a service, it's not a microservice and you can uh, basically continuously integrate and deliver that with the caveat that you know, different customer functions might interfere with one another, so you need that team to take charge of that. So in this case, you have CI-CD, you have containerization, but you don't have a microservice. On the other hand, you can have microservices without containerization. Uh, that's not something that people you know, do a lot today, but just to prove the concept, uh, you can have microservices. Microservices are basically the idea of separating your code into uh, very distinct and atomic uh, functionalities. So we will take that customer domain and we will break it up into different customer functions. 
the customer functions of, for example, get the customer's uh, uh, detail uh, will be completely separate from any other uh, function in terms of the code used, in terms of the data used, it might have its own data store uh, and all those things. You don't have to put it inside a container for it to be a microservice. It helps, but you don't have to do that. You can just deploy it as a different, you know, a jar file. Uh, you also don't have to have a, a, a cross-functional team to work on that in order to make it a microservice. You can have, you know, you can build it in a waterfall way. So a microservice is just a way of delivering software the containerization is just a an enabling technology that is akin to a virtual, you know, a virtual machine, but only a very smaller in scale. And the CI/CD process is basically the ability to uh, um, to move at velocity when deploying all of those things. So these are three separate things, but of course we use them interchangeably because they are very close together. It makes sense to use a microservices architecture with CI/CD and cross-functional. Uh, teams. It just makes sense because these things work very, very well together. Um, having said that, there are specific challenges with regards to on-prem and legacy systems that also need to play a part uh, in 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 this uh, in this game. So, what is the challenge and, and and what is the problem with with using those kind of systems? So, when we talk about DevOps and CI/CD and cross-functional teams and microservices and all of those good things. Basically, what we usually talk about is modern, uh, um, modern deployments, modern projects, mostly in the cloud, uh, where developers use kind of very uh, um, the latest and greatest in terms of their tooling, and they're able to really create results very quickly. The only problem with that is that in most organizations, that only covers a small percentage of what actually goes behind the scenes, because behind the scenes, uh, you will have your traditional IT uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, which includes systems like mainframes and systems like mid-ranges and, and on-prem SAPs and, and, and Oracle application servers and all kinds of different uh, Linux and, and Unix applications. These are on-prem systems. They're, they're there. They're not going anywhere in, in, in the near future. But they're not, not really compatible with that idea of containerization. They're not compatible with microservices necessarily. Um, they're, and, and they're not necessarily co compatible with DevOps. Now, in some legacy systems, you know, the idea of automating operations, you know, is not a new idea. Uh, for mainframes, for example, and for many others, uh, automa the, the operation stuff was really automated a long time ago, and everything is done using, you know, either scripts or products that, that do those kinds of things, like promoting between the environments, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not really about introducing automation into those processes. It's more about integrating that automation or integrating that kind of thinking into what you have outside of the legacy uh, uh, side. The biggest challenge around those things is that every one of those on-prem system is not there by its own. It, it also has kind of a, a middleware uh, envelope around that and an integration envelope around that that consists of, you know, multiple uh, uh, levels of, of technologies in terms of just uh, um, from different ages and with different technologies, with different uh, protocols. And when you're trying to bring that legacy or on-prem system into your modern world and trying to integrate that with your DevOps pipeline, that's where you will find the challenge uh, specifically difficult because those middleware products usually are proprietary. They have their own ways of deploying their workflows and 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 their uh, and and doing things like clustering and all kinds of things. So this is really where the challenge uh, would be. So what would be the best, you know, option of dealing with those legacy systems? So what we what the best practice around those systems is basically to kind of ignore, uh, in a way, those middleware layers or treat them as their own legacy system, but basically um, treat the problem or treat the challenge as, you know, an opportunity to, in a way, refactor the architecture. So a way to think about it is you have a legacy system or an on-prem system, and that on-prem system works, right? It has business processes and functionalities. It has a lot of data that's locked in there, and that's great. I mean, that's your system of record, and it's it's doing its its, its job. 
but you need to make it play well with everything on the digital side and really incorporate it into your DevOps pipeline uh, in a way that's not proprietary. So the way to do that is basically abstract in a, in a standardized way those functionalities on the legacy side. So a, a specific way of doing that is that you can generate, and if that generation can be automated, that's even better, uh, basically a wrapper, a proxy wrapper around those functionalities, which represent those functionalities from here on forward. And those fun functionalities can be automatically, you know, placed in, in code and do it in a kind of a low code approach. Um, they can be uh, uh, independently tested. So you can test those. Uh, we call them an open legacy. We call them SDKs. And that's the open legacy approach. Basically, you can test those SDKs separately for everything else. So you can move to a test driven design. And those SDKs are then kind of uh, the grain of a microservice. Now, that microservice might not be a pure 100% uh, microservice architecture in terms of it has uh, uh, some um, shared resources, mainly the, the legacy system behind the scene. But that gets you pretty close because you can add additional functionality on those microservices and basically be able to move to a microservice-based approach using CI, CD, using those cross-functional teams on everything on top of that legacy system. So you just treat the legacy system as a data source. Everything above it is modern in terms of having microservices architecture. The teams around it are modernized because they are cross-functional teams. And from there on, all of your deployments, versioning, and all of those uh, concerns uh, become standardized. So that's a way for you to pull those legacy systems into the modern world and into the modern DevOps uh, concept. So that's a way basically to leapfrog over your entirety of the middleware uh, a layer and into a modern uh, architecture. It will help you with most of your challenges around DevOps. It will not help you with everything because if you make changes, visible changes on the legacy side, you still have to promote them in a way that's a little bit more complex than what you would do uh, in just a plain DevOps uh, 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 pipeline, but it will get you 90% of the way at 10% of the effort. And that's something that's worthwhile. So that's kind of uh, in theory, right? So everything works in theory, but you want to, might want to see how it actually works in practice. And for that, I will move it to Alad to talk about his experience uh, with Alon uh, Insurance Company uh, and uh, I'll move it to him. So, Eldan. Thank you, Zev. Hello, uh, my name is Eldan Domer, and I'm the uh, director of infrastructure in DevOps at Ayalon Insurance Company, an Israeli company. Uh, Ayalon Insurance uh, is one of the six largest uh, insurance and finance group in Israel, which has uh, recent years demonstrated growth rates. Um, among the highest uh, in the insurance industry in Israel. Uh, the key distribution channel of uh, the company is insurance, insurance agents, uh, which uh, distributed uh, all over the country. Uh, and we, we, are serve, we, we are giving service to uh, one uh, uh, 1,300 uh, employees and 2,600 of uh, uh, agencies in Israel. Um, the company engaged in, in, in general insurance, long-term savings, and health insurance. Uh, like many other uh, traditional insurance companies in Israel, uh, we are using uh, legacy systems and application, uh, mostly running on AS400, developed in the maybe 20, last 20 years. Uh, the majority of uh, which run COBOL and RPG programs, very old systems. Um, in the past, uh, we built a full feature software, what we call uh, monolithic applications, which takes uh, one to three years of development and are irrelevant until they go to production. Uh, a challenge we faced was the non-normalized development environment uh, and different workflows for diverse development teams, mainly in the .NET and Java environments. 
uh, Ayalon was challenged with the increasing demand of customers for digital services such as mobile and web applications to simplify their communication uh, with the customer service and sales centers. Um, the competitive ecosystem in Israel pushed us to change the way that we do businesses by launching new services and achieving quick wins. Uh, DevOps uh, responds to these challenges by providing a full methodology and tools to take the business requirements and translate them to quick actions in terms of uh, time and value for the business. Uh, we tried to figure out how to take this challenge to practical steps by exploring how other companies in the market tackle similar problems. We found that uh, most insurance companies don't implement full DevOps methodology. Uh, the main reasons for this is a lack of cultural and technological readiness of the IT and the R&D departments. It seems that it's not easy to adopt changes, um, especially for systems who developed in the last 20 years. We set our success criteria by the following principles in order to provide true value to our customers. First, we asked our senior management to give us a full commitment upfront in order to implement the new approach. Uh, for this to happen, we realized we needed to instruct our teams to implement the new process. It wasn't the easiest thing to do, but most of the personnel were convinced that automating our development and operation tasks would take the company and themselves to another level. Second, um, uh, adopted, uh, adopted a new approach for new business services, uh, development based on microservice architecture. We have also uh, modernized our legacy systems by adopting the open legacy platform that expose uh, RPG and COBOL programs uh, or uh, emulation screens to modern front end clients by REST API, standard REST API, without uh, affecting uh, the legacy core backend. That it's most uh, uh, thing to to uh, to deal with uh, when we are uh, developing uh, uh, the traditional uh, systems. The outcome of the initiative was simply amazing. In a six months uh, project, we implemented the full DevOps uh, process and launched six new business services on our digital channels. Uh, we found that. Uh, IT is no longer the bottleneck. For example, we developed a, a, a new business products two months before the commercial agreement was uh, signed. Another example is a new service that allows customers to change their payment method, which involves three different core legacy applications, uh, and we Try, we succeed with uh, launching this new service in a very short uh, uh, term of uh, um, uh, time. Um, this project estimated a 12 months project before we uh, implemented DevOps. Uh, and finally, it took us only three months overall with the new tools until go to production. Um, and it saved to, to the company a lot of uh, money in terms of uh, contact center representatives and uh, other uh, employees who handle manually or by phone or by email uh, those uh, uh, requests by customer to change their uh, payment methods. Uh, we designed the process by splitting the big problem into smaller pieces. Um, those pieces were uh, source code management and version control, uh, which handled in the two separate systems for Java and for .NET uh, uh, code. Uh, 
build a, an automated compilation process, orchestration of the process, uh, provisioning to different environments, dev, test, and uh, production. Uh, was totally manual, and uh, as you know, it's uh, uh, it's very difficult to to do uh, and go to production uh, manually. It's uh, it was uh, from time to time uh, uh, failures because uh, uh, employees doesn't uh, understand what they need to do exactly, uh, and when it's automated, uh, the things don't happen. Uh, the container management and logging, auditing, and metrics uh, management. We needed the, the appropriate tools to deal with the, all of these uh, issues uh, as follows in this slide. Um, I alone used the, uh, Jira as the requirement management platform during the past five years to manage the full cycle of the IT development process from the requirement description filled by the business user through the requirement specification and the bug fix or feature development up to deployment to production. Second, we, uh, <clears throat> open, uh, we, we choose Open Legacy uh, in order to expose our uh, uh, programs in the legacy systems uh, in a very in a modern way uh, in REST API uh, and to uh, uh, automate uh, processes. We selected the Open Legacy platform uh, after reviewing a variety of products and concluding it was the simplest way to develop uh, integrated APIs. Uh, we we'll normalized our development process by aligning to Bitbucket and Git to manage our own source code and version control across Java and .NET projects uh, by speeding development process and adopting agile methodologies. We can easily deploy new uh, app versions and fixes uh, what was very difficult in the past. Uh, Jenkins and Maven are the tools we use to orchestrate CI/CD driven by Bitbucket events, uh, like commit or push events. Um, and to handle uh, containers, with, uh, we adopted the Docker and Kubernetes technologies. And on top of this, uh, we incorporated IBM ICP. Uh, which enables us to currently handle on-prem solutions, but also supports the plan uh, uh, to move the, uh, to cloud-based systems uh, in the near future. Uh, ICP supports multi-cloud orchestration along with replication, scalability, and monitoring, among other features, without being dependent on the proprietary solutions. It's really open. Um, this slide shows how the process uh, is handled by Jenkins, a very clear gra graphic flow of each step in the CI-CD process with easy and simple ways to investigate failures. Each deployment can be easily rolled back by Jenkins uh, in a one click for uh, 20 uh, seconds you're in the, uh, um, in the in a, a, in a version that work until you go to production a new version. Uh, this slide um, uh, it's the main display of deployment list in ICP. We can see each deployment with the the current status and containers and parts related and where on the ICP Kubernetes these services are running. Um, ICP allows also to roll back for any point in time deployment uh, uh, if needed. Uh, in the next slide, um, okay, I, I must say that it's not an easy process to implement, but we found out it's worth a lot for our business, especially for our business and customers. 
allow allow me to outline some of the lessons we learned along the project. The first one is the cooperation uh, among the relevant teams is crucial. Uh, get the management buy-in to handle issues that can threat the process. Uh, the third one is to choose uh, choosing the, the right platforms in terms of time to market and easy to use. Uh, the, the, this one can make a big difference. Uh, training and education of team and the IT teams is is mandatory. Uh, it's hard to change the mindset of uh, people who used to do things in the old school way. Uh, and adopt a tool that protects your investment and enables scalability and open legacy is one of these tools. Um, and the results uh, in speed of production integration is uh, undeniable as shown on the right side of, uh, of the slide. Uh, thank you. Zeb? Okay. Yes, sir. I think we'll uh, thank you a lot, and I think we'll move to uh, uh, questions and, and answer at this point. I think that All was right. a very uh, illuminating uh, use case, and um, we'll be more than happy to answer any, any question you might have. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, yeah, plenty of time for questions, folks. So, if you have a question for either one of our panelists, please just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. We'll go ahead and jump right on in. Uh, our first question here is. Um, Let's see. We tried solving the on-prem integration problem using uh, an SOA solution. How is this solution different? So that's that's actually a great question. I mean, when you talk about SOA, so a uh, service-oriented architecture, that's basically the way that uh, integration was done in the last 15, 20 years, even more uh, more than that. Uh, and and so I was really a great way of, of doing enterprise integration uh, back in the days. It solved a lot of problems where you have um, kind of point-to-point -point integrations and later on you had kind of a, the hop and spoke uh, pattern and they really uh, were, get, were challenges in terms of maintaining uh, and, and being able to, um, to make changes. Well, so it's kind of run, run its course, I would say. Uh, in today's modern architecture, so it might might not be the the absolute way a uh, correct way of 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 going about it. First of all, SOA lends itself to large you know enterprise service buses and middleware products and things of that nature that are by nature they're they're monolithic and they're they're complex. The main thing that they will solve is kind of standardizing all the environments on uh, on 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 the one language or one way of doing things and, and creating the processes around them. But that's no longer really a, an issue today because today we have that language that everybody has to speak. We have APIs, either RESTful APIs or event-driven APIs, but just creating those interfaces, that's not the biggest challenges or, or getting everything to talk with the same language, that's not the biggest uh, uh, challenge that you have today. The biggest challenge that we have today is how you incorporate all of those things in a way that eliminates complexity, that allows you to move faster, that de-layer de uh, your architecture. And on all of those fronts, SOA is actually the, the, the kind of the worst solution that you could choose. So going about it this way, uh, mainly automatically generating code to access directly those legacy systems and incorporating that code inside your uh, microservice architecture, that's kind of the opposite of SOA, and it gives you all the uh, flexibility, all the speed uh, and velocity that you would need, but, and that's the big change here, taking a cue for everything that happened outside of the enterprise world, meaning mostly code generation, it is scalable. So you're not building a point-to-point -point integration. You're not resorting to maintaining those very uh, um, those uh, those uh, specific solutions, but you have a way of generating automatically those solutions, which is very scalable because it's automated. 
So basically, it's a way of incorporating those concepts of cogeneration, of automation, of simplified API contracts, and bringing them into the enterprise integration world, uh, which is a different take on it than than so a uh, uh, traditional approach. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. Next question. Uh, could you please throw some light on deployment patterns? Sure. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and that maybe I'll let you kind of uh, tackle that one in terms of your actual experience on the field. Is Eldad on? They, they, they didn't hear the question it's uh so the the question is um could you please throw some light on deployment patterns okay um uh, what we did in the deployment process is uh, to implement uh, the cicd pipeline uh, uh, the first step in the deployment process is the uh, code commit okay uh, the trigger uh, the the build process in uh, Jenkins. Jenkins take the the uh, the code and the libraries uh, required to to build the uh, the application, the API, and uh, uh, taking all of this and move it to a container uh, in the te in the test and dev uh, environment. Um, after uh, QA uh, checking the uh, the API on the test environment, they are approving to move to the uh, to the next step uh, uh, to the business user that uh, check the service uh, uh, also. And after deployment, uh, right now uh, it uh, we we, we, sh we should. Uh, the IT is still uh, approving uh, move to production, but it's all uh, through the the uh, Jira and uh, Bitbucket, uh, and it's fully uh, automated. Uh, uh, so it's very easy to do uh, what we done in the past, uh, but took us a few days or more. Where uh, doing that now in the in minutes. And, and right. maybe I'll, I'll add to that one thing, which is, I think, important. Uh, there's this concept of recoverability, right? So uh, a lot of organizations that are not, for example, financial organization, they would even downplay uh, the importance of having test all you know, perfect. And they would just talk about the recoverability option, meaning if they deploy something to production and it's not working as expected, they have a way of recovering it back, back within you know seconds and or fractions of a second. Of course, I would not suggest that a financial you know institution would do the same. You know, downplay the the testing element of it. But I would absolutely recommend automating the recovering part of it, meaning that you will be able to recover from any kind of mishap or even just if you deployed something as kind of an a b testing so you deployed a new functionality and you're seeing that you know customers don't really engage with it or they engage with it in a way that you're not you know happy with uh, you have a way of automatically recovering from that update i think that's a very important aspect of it i think that uh, specifically for large organizations and enterprises that's not necessarily the way they used to think about things they used to think about things in a way that well we'll test everything and make sure it's perfect and then only then we will deploy it but they don't really think about being able to recover it very quickly and i think that's an inc incredibly important part of, of of the puzzle uh so i think you know recoverability is definitely something that you need to to focus on when de designing your deployment process excellent okay great we have some really great questions here so next one uh, do you recommend to use an api gateway if the answer is yes how does this impact the usage of microservices infrastructure specifically when deploying new versions of apps so yeah so the question of gateway i mean that's that's an interesting one i mean uh, gateways were created really as a way of rethinking the uh, governance of of soa architecture and 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 web services uh, and people figure out that in order to basically manage all of those apis that they have they have to have some component of it which is of course the gateway 
Uh, and gateways, they serve multiple purposes, but mostly I would say they are around security. So gateways provide security. So, but that's not the, their only function. Of course, they provide you with management in terms of just being able to uh, uh, con control throttling and workloads and things of that. Type. <clears throat> now, when you think about it this way, of course, gateways can be a central component, but are they enough? When you think about security to a, an API strategy, you have your outward facing APIs and they will be protected by a gateway. And you might have all of those, you know, microservices exposing APIs and those APIs will be protected by the gateway and you can have a great gateways. There are some you know, great vendors out there and they will provide you with very secure gateways. What happens if something happens from within the organization? What happens if, you know, one microservice, and of course the, the choreography pattern uh, basically allows microservices to use one another uh, through their APIs. I mean, as long as they're using the contracts, it's completely allowed for one microservice to use another. But what happens to those kinds of requests? Are they protected? So the gateway pattern is absolutely, you know, in some cases necessary, in some cases recommended, but it's not enough you need to do what is called in-depth defense, which is basically protecting those API calls from within the network. And for those, you have certain patterns, um, uh, patterns around um, micro gateways, uh, around protecting uh, uh, the, the microservices uh, as, as kind of a uh, encryption that's baked into them. Um, open legacy implementation of that basically uh, injects those kind of cross-cutting concerns into each and every microservice. But you need to, to think about both the gateway as the entry point, but also the, the, the in-depth defense or the in-depth uh, uh, security uh, 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 ramifications of moving to a microservice architecture that includes microservices that talk with one another constantly, and they need that communication to also be secured uh, and robust. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, next question here, uh, and this is a little uh, a little involved here, so bear with me here. Do you use Java, Glassfish, or Payara apps, WAR or JAR? If the answer is yes, how do you manage the deploy process with Kubernetes without impacting the production environment, maintain a zero window upgrades or downtimes? Okay, okay, so that's <laughs> go ahead. <with> that. <laughs> there. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's a that's a pretty specific, and we'll be happy yeah. to go you know, uh, um, further. But um, I, I would try to answer it in a more generalized way. Uh, one of the core concepts of microservices is there being kind of a polymorph, uh, um, and and and. and the idea is that a microservice exposes a contract and that contract is uh, basically the only thing that you need to know about it. So you don't need to know how it's implemented behind the scenes. Uh, so whether you use Java, JavaScript, Node.js, um, or whatever uh, 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 technology you're using to create those microservices, they should behave the same. That said, of course, as an organization, you might want to have specifically around the automation part of it, you might want to have specific processes that are geared towards specific technologies. And that's where the, uh, the idea of uh, DevOps teams come into play. And DevOps teams, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive because the whole idea of DevOps is that you will have developers that are also op operation people. So what are DevOps people, you know, are doing? I mean, they're not part of cross-functional uh, team. They're just, you know, people that, spe you know, uh, specialize in DevOps. What, what does that mean? And that's exactly where they come into play because these are basically your, in the organization, they are the knowledge center for doing all of those kinds of things. So they will create, you know, the script templates and they will create basically the playbook for dealing with all of those very specific technologies, technology issues in terms of deployment, in terms of automating the testing, in terms of all of those things. So they will create the templates for everybody else to pull from. So uh, that's a little bit of a more generalized answer to how do I deal with specific technologies? How do I deal with, you know, the proliferation of technology within my organization? You will have the DevOps team. That's a dedicated team 
that is the knowledge center or the knowledge base within the organization to have all of those templates ready for everybody else to pull from so that you're getting that standardization that you desire while also enabling your uh, actual DevOps, meaning the cross-functional teams, uh, to do what they need to do. All right, great. We are about 10 minutes to the top of the hour, so I think we have time for maybe two more questions. The next question, did you cover automated QA for APIs for functional performance and security perspective? It may be a question for LDAT. Yeah. Hi. Um, we, we didn't uh, implement yet uh, 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 this kind of uh, method of uh, uh, testing, but we are now in, in the process to uh, uh, establishing uh, an automated QA and uh, security to those uh, to these environments and APIs. All right. Great. Okay. Next question. Um, a little, little more general. How can we implement DevOps in hybrid cloud environments? So hybrid, I think, is is really becoming the more and more of a focus as organizations are moving, you know, towards the cloud. A lot of them understand that some workloads absolutely make sense on the cloud, uh, but some just absolutely do not make sense on the cloud. It's hard to move to the cloud, there's compliance issues, uh, there's just, you know, the ROI is not necessarily there. So what a lot of organizations are finding themselves struggling with is the kind of the need to maintain a hybrid environment where uh, half of their, or one leg is in the cloud and one leg is on-prem. Uh, and this approach really lends itself very nicely into a hybrid model because the challenge around hybrid model is that you have you know specific tools and, and tooling and, and products that helps you on the cloud side but not necessarily a lot of those on the on-prem side so basically if you have the ability to um as we said kind of abstract and elevate those business processes into microservices, you can use those entire set of tools as a continuum. So you can use Dockers from the on-prem all the way to the cloud. You can use microservices in, in a mesh. Some of them are backward facing, some of them are front end facing, and they are indistinguishable from another because you know all, they are all microservices that have a, a, a contract to them and that, that you can use. Uh, you can use the same kind of Git repositories uh, for all of those things. And you can use automation in order to make that process streamlined and continuous from the on-prem to the cloud side. Now, a caveat to that, you may might need to do some work in terms of the setup, uh, basically connecting whatever operations tool you have on your legacy side, on your on-prem side, uh, to those new uh, patterns of using. So, for example, if you would have a mainframe with a uh, product like uh, Endeavor or ISPW or, or any kind of source control, or if you're using other types of source control on, a, you know, an Oracle machine or, or something like that, you will need to, to connect those into your new DevOps pipeline. Once you do that, and we have some customers who are doing some pretty interesting stuff, for example, um, automatically regenerating all of the integration stack uh, on top of any change they make to uh, uh, a COBOL copybook, for example, on a mainframe side. So you can do all of those things. Uh, getting to a completely continuous change, that takes some setup and some work, but that's work that's very worthwhile because that will basically streamline everything going forward and combine the two worlds of the hybrid computing, the on-prem and the cloud in a way that's very, very robust and very easy to work with. Okay. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, does the solution still work if the APIs won't be put in the cloud? Absolutely. Uh, so, as somebody famously once said, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. Uh, <laughs> it's, there's not a you know huge difference in terms of technology. There's a difference in terms of price structure. There's a difference in terms of uh, how easy it is to maintain. Uh, and, and the concerns, you know, that somebody else is taking charge of. But in terms of the technology itself, you know, there's not a big difference between the cloud and non-cloud. Uh, and what we see a lot of customers actually doing is what they call the on-prem cloud, which is an even more private version of a private cloud. Basically, they have their own kind of servers, uh, but they just use cloud technologies on them. Uh, and the reason why that makes sense is exactly for DevOps reasons. If you use an on-prem you know, server, you're not getting a lot, it's not really a cloud, 
But if you use cloud technologies on top of that, you're able to, you know, for example, containerization and 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 all of those DevOps tools and and things of that nature. You're able to reach a lot of those benefits that are associated with the cloud. You're only doing it on prem, so it makes a lot of sense. And sometimes you have to do it for compliance issues, uh, but that pattern is very much alive and very much being used more and more by customers. So the short answer is absolutely yes, you can absolutely use DevOps for APIs uh, anywhere, not just on the cloud. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna push our luck and ask you one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, let's see, what if I need event queues? Does this solution still work? Yeah, again, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, event queues uh, in this context will just be another interface. We talked a lot about an API interface to those uh, microservices. Uh, in this case, it will just be supporting uh, an event-based uh, message interface. Now, having said that, there is one caveat that people need to know about, and that is uh, microservices, by definition, they hide everything in terms of implementation, but what they expose publicly, meaning the contract, the API contract, that's a very public thing. So um, a lot of patterns around choreography really rely on those contracts to be constant and static and not ever change. Uh, and of course, you can reach that, but if you plan on starting using REST APIs and then moving the same to an event-based API, you need to be aware of the fact that that will require changes in terms of everybody's using those uh, um, those APIs. There are some ways of mitigating that. For example, if you automatically generate those contracts, like the way Open Legacy does that, you can automatically generate flavors of the uh, of the APIs, so that for each API you will have multiple flavors, and they will share a code base between them. Uh, for example, the SDK. Uh, and so you will be able to make changes only in one place and still be able to use them in two different ways. Uh, but these are considerations that you need to make uh, in terms of uh, how you consume those APIs. Consuming a RESTful API and consuming an event API are uh, different things that are meant for different usage patterns. Uh, and it's all a matter of uh, figuring out what's the best approach design-wise um, uh, and and that's the kind of thing that you know architects and and uh, are doing every day, and we we definitely help them with that kind of uh, uh, thinking. All right, great. Well, we're about three minutes to the top of the hour, so I'm going to have to close down the question and answer period. Um, thank you to everybody who did submit questions. We had some really great ones. I I'm very impressed with the with the questions that came in. So, uh, but before we close out today's webinar, uh, I did promise at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, our winners for today's uh, gift card drawing are, uh, the first name is Bosky Jaswal, mm -hmm. and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, our second winner is uh, Jaya uh, Chilla Kamari. Congratulations, Jaya. And our final winner for today is, uh, this is an easy one, Stephanie Tan. Congratulations, Stephanie. Congratulations to all three of you today. I uh, do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the, the webinar, or if you just want to listen to it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Um, we will be sending out an email a little bit later on today that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it will be right there waiting for you. And while you're there, please take a look at some of the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or two that pique your interest. Uh, Zev and Eldad, thank you both for such a great presentation today. Um, good stuff. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.